Welcome to the Mindful Mutiny Podcast. I'm Jeremy Van Wert, CEO, therapist, and transformational coach, helping you get unstuck from burnout and stagnation. On the Mindful Mutiny Podcast, we thoughtfully rebel against anything that keeps you from achieving your highest potential. Make sure that you like and subscribe and leave a review on the platform that you're listening to this on. It's very important for the growth of a podcast for that sort of thing to happen. Today, we have a really fantastic guest. But before we get to that, I am a transformational coach. There's a lot going on in our world. And right now, a lot of us feel stuck. A lot of us feel like we don't exactly know where we're going, where we're going spiritually, where we're going professionally, where we're going personally, and how to get there. I help you learn the skills and execute the skills on how to get there if you would like to have some time with me and start talking about that sort of thing and see what it would like be like to move forward in something like that, visit my website that's at the bottom of the screen here. I wanted to include this patch, which was recorded over the original things that I had said this specific podcast episode was going to be about. And I'm changing it right now because originally it was going to be about resilience and the power of pushing on and these sorts of different things. But the wonderful thing about having a great conversation with a person is that the conversation goes the way that it goes. And what this conversation turned into was far more than just simply a story of resilience. It really did turn into a story about how your environment, your surroundings, they change your potential, they change your mindset. And Howard's ability to create environments with design, with color, with things that change the way that an entire place feels, it's something that became the theme of what it was that this specific episode became about. We're talking about psychology. We're talking about what is important in a, a, a surrounding, what you, sur what you surround yourself with. So without further ado, we're going to slip right back into this podcast that is going to be about the power of your surroundings. And one more note. We had some sound quality issues during this because Howard was in a space where he was doing this podcast with a cellular phone connection. So there's some times when his voice glitches out and when his, his, his video freezes. I'm very sorry for that. However, I ask the, the viewer to have some grace and please press through with this because the things that he was talking about through an entire lifetime of doing design and art and watching things take form around the spaces that human, uh, humans occupy was really, really valuable. So without further ado, out of this patch and back into the podcast episode. Right now you're doing interior design and you're doing some acting right no actually i've turned 70 this year in september and when i turned 65 i retired from interior design it's still my love still my life but my life took a test uh i used to do a local tv show called tj kate's nashville entertainment tj kate's was my producer on that show and it was a paid advertisement type thing and he came out with his first movie called uh, the haunted farmhouse and he needed a ghost in the movie and uh, he asked me he said I don't know anybody that looks better in a top hat than you do so uh, he asked me to do the movie once I did that movie it led to other things and it led to movies reviews and more and led to a little zombie movie uh, I've got one coming up that I'm going to shoot in Hollywood called who's going to take care of me we just got Al Pacino's uh, Catherine Pacino's mother-in-law Catherine Pacino uh, it's got uh, Paul Williams from the 80s. He also did Planet of the Apes. He was a little blonde-headed ape in the movie. He's in the movie. There's a lot of big stars in that movie. Uh, I've got another one called uh, Without Warning, and I've got a featured role in that one coming up that will be uh, shot where I play the father of a young girl that something happens. I don't know if she give away the what's going to happen, but... Uh, that's another one coming up and that's going to be shot in April and that takes about 
90 days to shoot, and then we'll probably have the premiere also here in Nashville, and then it'll be around the country after that. So uh, the interior design is kind of, it's in my heart, but it's, I've gone a different direction. I've reinvented myself again. <laughs> Well, you know, now you're doing this wonderful acting and everything like that. I'd like to start with the beginning of everything. So now we had talked about your father being Little Roy Wiggins, and um, you started in Nashville at a certain period of time, and your father was doing music. What was your childhood like? Uh, my childhood was kind of, well, any. Seems normal because that's your life. But I grew up in a neighborhood where uh, Bobby Lloyd, Stu Phillips, uh, Ralph Emery, Skeeter Davis—they all lived on my road. And uh, so, and then uh, Brenda Lee's manager was down the road a little bit further. So I grew up in a, a neighborhood called Brentwood here in Nashville, and it's become kind of like the elite neighborhood to live in in the uh, Nashville area. But uh, all these people, my parents had a, a, a nightclub in the basement of their house that had a jute box and uh, records. And every Saturday, famous people would come and they practice and they entertain and have a party every Saturday night at my house. So uh, to me, it was annoying because as a kid, I'd go to bed at eight o'clock. Of course, I really wasn't sleeping. I was in my room watching TV and listening to everything going on. But... <laughs> But people were always around me that were famous, but I, I just didn't think of it because my generation liked rock and roll. Now everybody likes country. And uh, so I never really told anybody who I was to. I became a lot older because I liked rock and roll. I didn't like country. <laughs> so, Well, early on, you you have all these famous people around you. And you had talked about a little bit earlier your you, – you had a your family had a relationship with Dolly Parton and a, a couple of these other people. And, and so you're, you're young and you're growing up. Uh, what, what is it like being around all these people? Well, they're people just like anybody else. I mean, uh, one story I have is Andy Griffin actually started on the Grand Ole Opry and uh, he ate at our house before he left Nashville to make the movie, no time for sergeants. And that that's where he married, met Don Knox and that led into Mayberry RFD and all that. Uh, but he was he started off in country music, but people don't know that. He just he took a different direction. And because of that movie, it led him to a different avenue. So uh, but there's a lot of I mean, we had Perry Como in our house. We've had uh, oh Marty Robbins, uh, just just people were coming and going all the time. So uh People that I, I admire that even weren't in country music. My friends were with father with Barbara Eden. Uh, they were good friends. Uh, I actually found out more about my parents' friends after my father died. Because you can Google his name and you, all these things come up. And uh, But to me, they I didn't really pay attention to them when I was living up. You know, later, I know who these people are. <laughs> So. Yeah, no, no kidding. And and so like, you know, you're, you're, you're growing up and, and your father is heavily involved in the Grand Old Opry, right? This is, when right. that's all kind of starting. He's on the board for this. And uh, what was the my, Grand Old my Opry My father like? actually started uh, famous at, at the age 13. Uh, when he was 13, he played with Eddie Arnold and they did the Lucy and the Hayride. And actually, my father's manager was Colonel Parker, the same as Elvis. In fact, I just did an Elvis documentary where I get to speak about that that's coming out in the future. And uh, there's a story. Uh, Eddie Arnold got mad at all his employees, except for my father. And but one of the employees was Chet Atkins, and he fired Chet Atkins, and Chet Atkins became famous. The other one was Paul uh, uh, Colonel Parker. When uh, Eddie Arnold fired Colonel Parker, he gave him $35,000. And when he gave him $35,000, he took that money and bought his part of Elvis's contract and got Elvis as a star. And then that made history. So without these unfortunate things happening that led to fortunate things happening, uh, 
that there might not have been Elvis, I don't know. But uh, it's funny, you're, my dad always, always said, I wish I was fired, because everybody was fired became famous, more famous. So, uh, so just an interesting story. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It can really turn things around. And, you know, so, uh, you know, er, early on, you're, you're, you're liking rock and roll, but you're living in this kind of like world of country. What is it that you had originally wanted to do with your life? Where did you want to go? I always wanted to be an interior designer like I was. I mean, that is the direction my life took up to age 65 and, and still a part of my life. But uh, I like beauty and, and I started at an early age and I know why I started at an early age. My dad traveled the road all the time and my mother decorated the house probably three times you know, while I lived in it when I was 18. But the last time she did it, she hired a, a professional interior designer. I love the room he did for me. I love, I could see the difference between what my mother did and what he did. And uh, I have an interesting story on that. My father was on the road. Mother had bought everything new in the house. We had new drapes, new furniture, new, new everything. And uh, my father, father comes in off the road. He turns on a, uh, sits in a brand new recliner, goes, turns on a brand new TV set and didn't say one thing. Mother said, well, don't you notice anything? He said, did you get your hair done today? <laughs> and it's like no telling how much he spent I'm, I know it was a lot but that influenced my life because I could tell the difference between a professional helping her and her doing it herself and the colors that he did in my bedroom they followed me throughout my life I've added more colors to them but they're my favorite colors because uh he just knew who I I don't know how he did it or I became what he did but it, it it affected my life, so that's why old, I was an interior designer. How old were you? I, I was probably 12, 12 or 13, somewhere in there. So, uh, and I didn't even know what an interior designer was, but, and I never even really saw the guy. I just saw what he did. And it's just like that, made, I love my room. It, I still think of it. I think of all my, I think of my dorm room I had as a kid because I've, every environment I've ever lived in has been beautiful period. So I've surrounded myself with beauty and I don't understand how other people don't see the beauty in life. I could go anywhere and I see beauty, but a lot of people, they see it, they just don't recognize it. They, it's not important to them, but to me it is. Talk a little bit more about the, yeah. the beauty thing, because this is something that's actually pretty, I'm pretty passionate about. My life changed substantially when i moved into a beautiful area an area that that's inspiring mountains trees and everything like that and the environment is so influential in my existence out here in the forest for you it sounds like it's good design and color and beautiful things that that create a sense of uh, like a like a like a mastermind of creativity around you is that kind of how it works yeah I, I think it's uh, I'm an artist but I just don't paint on canvas I paint the room I can see things in my head it's a blessing and a curse because I like to go shopping I always have and when I go shopping I look at anything and not shopping for it and I'll picture it where it could go in the room what it looks like and it, and I don't make mistakes so it's hard for me to come across something beautiful that I have a spot for not to buy it because I'm, I'm like, I know it's going to look good there. I've got to have it. And I've always kind of had a small um, goals in my life, even as a child. I mean, I remember when I was young, too, I wanted a painting and uh, the painting was, uh, I thought it said $50. I just barely saw it when I was out and uh, that but I went back and it was $150 and I thought I'm still going to get that painting. So I saved up my money for $150 and bought that painting. So I've always thought there's nothing I can't achieve. I just have to wait long enough to get the money to do it. And I was very bad about not eating. Uh, even my mother would give me like $5 to eat lunch money every day. Well, at that time you could buy milk for three cents and bread was free. 
So I take and buy a little bit of milk and a little bit of bread and pocket that five money, five dollars a day. So I was making a hundred dollars a month as a kid not eating, you know. So I could buy anything I wanted. So if I, I wanted that hundred and fifty dollar painting, that was only a month and a half of not eating, and I could have that painting. <laughs> so that's it. And yeah. So so you're you're kind of moving on. You're going into high school here. And uh, you're 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 getting out of high school. Where did you go to? Wh what did you do in high school? Where did you go to college? Uh, I went to Franklin High School. Uh, I started off. This is an interesting story. I really started off being a veterinarian. I was in veterinary school for a year, and I called home and said, "I don't like this. It's not what I want to do." They said, "Well, there's a design school in Franklin called O'More. Would you like to do that?" And I said, "Sure, I'll go to O'More," because they could see in me before I probably did, that I was talented. I mean, my room always was the best room in the house. And and I've always, I, I don't deny it, I'm very materialistic because materialistic things make me happy. I can't help it. But uh, but uh, so I went to Elmore. And when I did, went to Elmore, that's truly what I wanted to do. And it didn't take me long to become one of the world's 35 leading interior designers because right after Elmore, Phone's ringing. After, after O'More, I uh, got to be an Andrew Martin, one of the world's 35 leading interior designers that I was telling you about. So uh, that that was a big honor. I made a mistake because that was international. And I'm in a book with uh, uh, Jane Churchill, which is Churchill's granddaughter, and all these famous designers. And they asked me to go to England to get like an Academy Award that was televised over there. I was too young. I, I, I thought I was scared to go to England. I'd never been anywhere by myself, especially to another country. And uh, my wife had knee surgery at that time and and she needed me. So I just didn't go. If I had gone, I think my life would have changed. Uh, and I know it would because I would have been around some very affluent people at that time that could have taken me to the next level. It did change in time, but it just took later on to do it. Uh, I also had the opportunity, I'm in Nashville Women in Film, and Lin Linda Edgen owns, uh, is in charge of that. Before HTV, she came to me, and there was a guy that wanted to do a uh, interior design program, and I would have been the first person to have an interior design program. But at that time, I didn't know of HTV, and I didn't even know what it could do for you. Later on in life, I was talking about how we met because I did try to get on an HTV or have my own TV air interior design program later in life, but I didn't accomplish it. But she said, we met because I brought somebody over to your house and we were going to do an interior design show. I said, what happened? The guy left, he had an accident and he got killed. So faith just took that away from me because otherwise I would have been a famous interior designer. So that's twice that it's happened that I kind of let or fate took in and it didn't lead down that avenue. Uh, I finally did become a famous interior designer, but it was many years later after uh, starting my own business, touring down Atlanta and getting featured in a lot of magazines and books and stuff like that. Yeah, so. it sounds like you were really consistent about what you were doing and, and where you wanted to be. I've always had small goals and my goals and I've always set up goals every as a, even as a child, you know, I was saving up money to buy this. I wanted to do this. Uh, I achieved that. I wanted to do something else. It's just a matter of setting like eating a dinosaur. You do it one step at a time. Uh, I'm not I'm pursuing acting now. I'm taking a row. I, I, my dream is probably to be on a Hallmark movie, which I am going to appear with a Hallmark actress coming up pretty soon and do a bit parts, maybe like one of those Christmas things that my next generations, because they keep showing them every Christmas, say, that's my, that was my grandfather. Or that was my great grandfather. Just like I can go on the internet now and I can find out things about my father that he never told me or I never knew, but I can Google it and I can find these things out. So it's almost like a conversation with someone who has passed because you're always alive on TV or on the screen. So. I want to re re uh, go go back in time here because you told me an awesome story about you being shy and you originally just not being socially bold and you having to kind of come out of your shell. 
what was the thing that precipitated you kind of coming out of your shell and realizing the power of your personality? Uh, that was very, I, when I was young, I could, I loved to dance and I was confident on the dance floor. I would ask any pretty girl, anybody to dance with me because they would. I didn't have the fear of rejection. But away from that, I did. I, I matured early and I had hair and I was just like self conscious about that. And uh, I, I just, I just wasn't comfortable uh, asking a girl out unless it was on the dance floor. So I thought to myself, that's about the time they started having those male strip contests. And I thought, I'm going to get over my shyness. I'm going to enter one of the male strip contests because I can dance and I can strip down the Speedos. And I had a, a great body. So uh, I did it. And I won. And, and I remember I didn't tell anybody. And my mother found out about it. And she, you know, she complained. I'm like, I'm glad I did it. I'm happy I did it. I mean, I haven't actually got a job offered to do it, but I didn't take the job. But uh, but if I hadn't done that, I would have married my beautiful wife because it gave me the confidence to to do what I can do. I mean, a lot of things that you're scared of, they're not that scary if you do it. It's all in your head. So it's like, it, it just gave me the confidence to be confident. And once I did that, I learned the trick. You know, face your fears, do them. It's not that hot hard. hard. Uh, acting, I never thought I would be an actor. I mean, at school, I would never like to read or do public speaking or anything like that. But I also had another transition period in my life as an interior designer, and they asked me to speak in Atlanta and the Vegas market. Well, I can talk interior design. I'm, I'm kind of, there's a lot of questions about interior design couldn't answer so I knew I wasn't going to make a fool of myself so when I did the speeches in Atlanta and in Vegas people loved me they were asking for autographs taking pictures with me I came home my wife said you're a different person I said yeah people love me I said you I got pictures of these these women are coming up and they're they're wanting pictures with me and autographs I said it changed my life I like I love this I never thought I would do that that's what my father did and uh, I thought I was too shy and not confident enough to do it. But later in life, I had confidence. And that's why it's changed again. It's like, let's do it. I love it. I'm not scared what you think of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, you, you, you also talked about reinventing yourself a number of times uh, yeah. in, in your life. That, that being kind of a guiding force in how you have gotten to the place where you've gotten to. And so Correct. can you talk about these times that you've reinvented yourself? What did you do? When was it? What forced you to do it? All of that. I, th I, th I think it's, uh, it's almost like if you have an alcoholic problem or something, you have to admit to yourself, I don't like that about me. I'm going to change it. Uh, the one thing after I got married, just like most couples, I gained weight. And, uh, and it was gradual. I mean, over the years, because you got... A holidays coming up, gaining five pounds this year and five pounds next year and all that. And I remember, and I really didn't think of myself as fat, but I remember looking in the mirror and I thought, you're fat. And I was like a hundred pounds heavier than I am now. And I thought, I don't like that. I mean, I'm going to change that. So it's about the time when Atkins Diet came out and I never even bought the book. Somebody said, just give up bread, give up sweets. That's all I did. So I started eating, and, I, and my weakness is a buffet still is. I mean, something about a buffet, the I guess the stinginess of me, if I can eat one plate and pay the same amount of money as eating six plates, I'm going to eat six plates. So uh, what I did, I, I went on Atkins. When I went on Atkins, it worked for me completely. I mean, I would buy one pair of pants a, a month. Where every day by the next month I would be in a different size, and I went from actually a 53 inch waist down to a 29 inch waist quickly, and uh, and I say that, and I'm still that. I'm 70 years old. I still got a 29 inch waist, but I don't stay on Atkins. I'm con condescent of what I'm eating. I will cheat because you are supposed to cheat every now and then, but I think is it worth me cheating to eat that? And if I eat that, I'll eat less the next day. So uh, I maintained my weight. I'm not trying to lose anymore, but it worked all my life. 
uh, the local paper here in Nashville did an article on me saying Atkins was dangerous at the time and it's not healthy for you and all that. And I was probably in my th early, late twenties, early thirties, somewhere in there. I'm 70 years old. I still maintain that. I, I tried to get in touch with them. Of course, everybody's left. They're probably passed on or got other jobs. And I'm like, no, it worked. It worked for me. And it, and it, it's been a way of life for me. And, and like I said, anything you don't like, you can change. I didn't like being shy. I changed it. I didn't like being fat. I changed it. If you, you have choices in your life. You can go left. You can go right. You can do anything you want to do. So all you got to do is say, that's the direction I want to go. Make small changes. It's not going to happen overnight. Do it one little step at a time. Every day, think about a little something you want to do to help you reach that goal. And you'll get there. Don't be in a hurry. Most people get in a hurry. They want instant success. It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, uh, Billy Ray Cyrus, I did his house. and. Billy Ray Cyrus was a local talent here in Nashville. And everybody, and he says, I've been in Nashville 25 years before he had achy, breaky heart. He was trying for 25 years to become a star. He did it on that one break and song. Everybody locally said, well, he, he's a one hit wonder. It's not going to happen because they knew, knew him for 25 years. He showed him wrong. He took it from that to being on TV, to having a famous daughter, to, to just... He showed them, you know, so it's like, you don't think I can do it. I'll show you. I can do it. <laughs> well, you, you so. So it, it, it sounds like one of the themes of your life is that you make decisions. You go for it full bore. You you're just going to make it happen. Sometimes these things take time. What has it been like for you at times when you were going in a direction and and it felt like you were really rolling a boulder uphill? Has that ever happened to you? I've never felt that way because mm -hmm. I'm, I've never had a deadline when I was going to do something. So, like I said, I just set little bitty goals that I can reach. You know, if I if I make it to this goal, then I'll set me another goal. So I'm not really disappointed because I I don't set a deadline on myself. Like I like to do the Hallmark movie, but I haven't put a deadline line on myself. So uh, it happened when it happens. You know, God plays a, a role. Uh, you don't tell him when you want to do it. He lets you do it when you do it. It may not have been the right time for me to be a famous interior designer when I was in my 20s, when I had two opportunities to do so. It may come. It may lead me to another direction. I don't know. But I just let life happen. I, I don't put pressure on myself. I, I try to stay stress-free. I think that's one of my big secrets is anything stresses me out, I'm going to either change it or I'm going to walk away from it. And it's just like, if you don't like your job, leave it. If you don't like your spouse, leave them. If you don't like whatever's happened, you've got a choice, you know. And it's like the way you look at things is you don't dwell on the negative. You dwell on the positive. And the other thing I believe is surrounding yourself with people with your same likes. I think that's one reason I'm, I'm a big Facebook person, because Facebook person has connected me and done me a great big uh, launch to where I want to become, because I'm surrounded with people who love antiques, who love dancing, who love movies, who love beautiful things, who are famous. And through that, I've gotten... Uh, one of my Christmas books, I know it's a little different direction, but I'm in uh, this Christmas book that uh, Christmas and Designers Home, which features my home. This was many years ago. I just got an email yesterday that they're going to redo the book again, and they're going to add other designers because it was a great big seller around the world. And she wanted to know if I had more pictures to add to my pictures to be in the book again for the re-edition of it. I didn't plan it. It's just because I made the right connection. That's her dream. And her dream became part of my dream. So uh, it's just connecting to the right people. You can have all the talent in the world because there's many, many, many talented people. There's a lot of people who can see. There's a lot of people who can do a lot of things, but they don't have the connections or the desire to do what it takes or the ambition to take to reach there. Uh, Talent won't do it on its own. I mean, it's got to be who you know and, and the connections you make along the way. 
well, you're at a certain age here. You're loving rock and roll. You're living in this kind of like country bubble, I guess I could explain it. You want to do um, interior design. You get married. At what point do you start to really see the value in where you grew up and the people that you knew and the network that that provided and really kind of come into recognizing everything that your father had done to surround himself in a heck of a, heck of a network? Well, it it's all been kind of gradual and kind of looking back on it, things happened that made me who I was. One thing that I think was a big influence on me is actually Dolly Parton. Uh, Dolly Parton, uh, hey, well, let me back up a little bit. Dolly Parton had come to Nashville and she started singing on the Porter Wagner show. My dad had Grammar Guitar Company at that time. And he took me to make the first publicity pictures of Dolly and Porter. And so I met Dolly when she, before she was just starting her fame. And I fell in love with her. And then Saturday night, my dad did the Opry and Dolly was doing the Opry. So we talked behind stage all the way up to she made nine to five. And I remember learning a lot of things from her because it's it's almost like she's an old soul. She's one of the conversations we had, she said, Howard, when my career is over, I'm gonna write children's books. Well, her career's not over, but she managed to work that as part of her dreams. So it's like uh she's she's a lot like me. She takes small steps and then gets larger steps and she makes her connection. That's how I learned it. She treats everybody the same. I mean, uh, she, one time uh, she invited me to go to, she did this fundraiser in her hometown in Sevierville, where she took, uh, she did a, a, at the high school, a scholarship where people paid and then she bought college educations to help her town. She took her tour bus and she took a second bus behind it, which was just her personal friends. And I was on that bus with like RCA secretaries and just, just her friends, not famous people, just friends. She took us all to eat and she ate with me above everybody else. You know, it was just her and I at the table having lunch. So that's one, th one memory I have. The other thing, I was in a car accident. If you see my ear there, I kind of cut it off and they sewed it on. Uh, I was in the hospital and I was in the hospital with a broken neck. Well, Dolly was on her rise to fame and she came to see me in the hospital. And I was in traction because of my broken neck and she brought her sister Stella and another girlfriend with her. And there was like two hospital uh, chair beds beside the bed. And my parents were sitting in the bed and in comes Dolly. Well, the two girls got the chair and Dolly was standing up uh, along the wall. My father asked Dolly, she said, would you like to sit on the foot of the bed? And I said, yeah, Dolly, sit on the foot of the bed. So I tell everybody had Dolly Parton in my bed. So uh, <laughs> that, that was fun. And then I remember she wore this uh, peach velvet pantsuit, and I have a picture of her. And uh, so since I was in traction and really couldn't see her, but through these little glasses that I was wearing, she stood above my head. And that still gives me a grin, because I've seen a, a part of Dolly that other people, other guys don't get to see, <laughs> you know. So that was really interesting. And then I remember a male nurse came into the room. And he took my vital signs and he left and he forgot what they were because he was so upset about it. And then uh, my father took the girls to the elevator and they came back and said, there was this young couple about to get in the elevator and the girls were in it. And his girlfriend or wife pulls him back and says, you're not getting in that elevator. <laughs> you know. So, But she just, and she brought me one of her first RCA uh, publicity pictures where she's got kind of turtleneck like I'm wearing. A, a black leather vest and her hair almost looks like a French twist at that time. More normal looking, not the big country star that we think of Dolly Parton in the beginning. And she signed it and she says, I love you, but don't tell everybody. Well, hell, I, I told everybody. <laughs> you know. And the other thing she used to tell me all the time, she said, Howard, I love you. And when I lose weight and divorce my husband, I'm going to marry you next. Well, that didn't happen. She did lose her weight, though. <laughs> And her husband's may get out of the picture someday. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and I told my wife, I said, I won't cheat on you unless Dolly calls. If Dolly calls, I'm out of here. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you've so. got, you got one hall pass. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I got one hall pass. That's it. And I told her at the very beginning, right when we married. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it it sounds like Dolly has been a lifelong friend, uh, and um, it it also sounds like her genuine kindness and her real friendship has been something that has been an enduring feature in your life. Well, I, I observed her not knowing where she was going to go in the future. And like I said, all the stories that you hear of her, her brothers and her sisters, I've been around her. I've heard all those stories, but they're all true stories. So I've got my stories like I'm sharing with you. If you're telling a true story, then you're not you're not upset about it. There's nothing you can ask me that I haven't got the answer for because I've answered it before. Doing these podcast shows with you and other podcasters and movies with you, I've told that story a dozen times so i can tell it again it's 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 the truth so it's just the way it is so i'm not scared of what, what you might ask me that it makes me look like an idiot <laughs> you know <laughs> well it, it, it's it's so you were born in a really unique situation you had access around you to different worlds of entertainment you certainly had the uh, the the country music network around you and everything like that, but it, it you know it, it sounds like your trajectory was one of artistic expression in a different way. You have this aesthetic design direction for yourself, mm -hmm. that you, and but mm -hmm. you, I'm sure. It, tell me about this if I'm right or wrong. That this network that you had, these people that you knew, were valuable to you in where it is that you ended up doing your interior oh, yeah. design. That's absolutely true. Uh, famous people are people just like you and I. Uh, when I first started off in interior design and I was working at a furniture company, one of my dad's best friends was uh, Tammy Wynette. Well, Tammy Wynette would come in the store and just say, Howard, just yell for me without just, and I come running and I get my little pad and I, I write all the stuff up she wanted. And, in the beginning, when that would happen, it would make me nervous. And I thought, well, she's no different than anybody else. She's just a friend of my parents. I'm like, forget who she is, you know, just forget the name and just treat her like you do everybody else, like Dolly does. So that's what I did. And I've gotten so good about not remembering people's names. I can't do it anymore. It's like I just treat everybody the same, no matter if you are somebody famous or you're not. But what I have learned is the, the connection aspect and treating everybody the same, because you don't know who knows who, you don't know how they can uh, affect your life or how they could change your life. You know, your life is a combination of your three best friends and the people you come in contact with. So if you want to be a singer, you should be surrounded by singers. If you want to be interior design, be in have people that you inspire to be like so that you become more like them. And the, the other thing I know is everybody's approachable. I mean, you have a dream. I'm not scared to go up to the famous world. Well, actually, Albert Hadley is the world's uh, best known interior male designer. He was born here in Nashville. I just called him up and became friends with him. I became with friends with Mario Barada, Stan Topol. Uh, a lot of famous interior designers. And I just introduced myself, told them who I was, and we're friends, lifelong friends. And it's like, uh, just just do it, just try. You know, it's, not, it's nothing's gonna happen by if they say no, but a lot can happen if they say yes. And through those connections, they'll help you and they'll help you get to your career. There's no no jealousies or, or, or fear of losing who they are by helping somebody else. And it's kind of like, play back you know i've had good fortune let me help somebody else have good fortune you know i'm confident in what i do i can help you get to where you want to be yeah i'm recognizing this very thing in the world that i'm getting into as i am approaching people like yourself uh, mm -hmm. and, you know to uh, to talk to and to uh, to interview and everything like that. And it's been a very gratifying experience to uh, consistently get contacted back and have well, the pod, the conversations. Pod, the podcast system being with uh, Brian on movies review and more just took me a whole new different direction because 
uh, movies review and more. We've had William Schaffner on the show, D.D. Wallace. Uh, Brian knows everybody. He knows. Uh, I, I, I'm like I said, I'm bad at names. I can't remember names when I want to, but but uh, he just knows everybody. So Brian has been an influencer in me, helping me to become who I want because he knows everybody. He has connections also. I have different connections than he does, but he has the Hollywood connections. So I've become friends with Catherine Pacino, uh, just just a lot of people. And uh, uh, it's it's fun because through your connections, you can get other connections. And, it, and it's kind of helped me. And the podcast connection, uh, you know, we were number fourth in the nation on uh, podcasts. We're number 15th in the world of podcasts. I didn't even know that when I joined. I didn't even I didn't even know what I joined into when I joined it. It all started with Rachel Roberts, which was with Movies Review. They came to Nashville, Nashville Women in Film. And this is just to show how fate comes in this play. I went to the wrong location in the morning to where I was supposed to go. They were like side by side. And Rachel was in the lobby and she was doing her coffee talk. And I met her during the 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 seminar and just you know talked to her and stuff like that so i walked over and we just started talking and then it came time to, for her to do coffee talk and she said you want to do coffee talk with me i did i told stories like i did now she said you're the most interesting man i've ever talked to you you know and that led me to be on movies review and more i never heard of movies review and more until that day and i said sure and that's just led to more and more things i mean Sometimes fate just steps in. I mean, you do the right things, but like I uh, tell all my single lady friends, if they want to meet a man, Prince Charming isn't going to come and knock on your door and say, will you marry me? you got to put yourself in a situation where it could happen. So I was in a situation where this happened, and it did. I didn't plan it. Fate took in, and it led me that direction. So put yourself where you need to be. Just don't wish for it and hope it happens. You've got to take actions to make it possible where it could happen and don't be disappointed if it doesn't happen. It will happen in time. So all through your life, you've put yourself, it, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm seeing this piece of you where you consistently put yourself in situations that challenge where you are today for who you exactly. want to be tomorrow. Right, exactly. Exactly. You've got to be in the location where you where you need things to happen. It's it's uh, like I said. It's what it's all about. <laughs> have you ever have you ever approached anybody, uh, and uh, it's gone better than you could have ever imagined it being? You just cold approach. Oh, many times. Great many, things. Many happen. times I approach people, but uh, I don't approach people on the idea that it's going to help me. Right. I approach people that I admire and through that connection and through becoming friends and not putting pressure on them like I'm liking you because you can get me somewhere. They're liking me because we're friends and it's their idea to help me. I don't ask for the idea, but I put myself in the position where it could happen. I mean, it's a difference between, you know, nobody wants to be liked for who they are. They want to, I mean, you know, as far as where, what you can do for them, they want to be liked as a person. If you have common interests and common dreams, that's an interest that becomes a friend of theirs. And through that, it, it can lead to other things. I don't do it like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call on any of my, I wouldn't call Dolly Parton up and say, you're making a movie, put me in it. I, I wouldn't do that. That's, that's going, if she wants me in the movie, she'll call me. It's like you don't put yourself in that position where you're asking for it. They've got to ask you, but you got to be there to be be asked, you know, in their presence or their thoughts. Yeah, you have to be yeah. you have to be relevant in their thoughts currently. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in. Uh, well, I'll go back a little bit. When I was a, an a interior designer, I had this self hypnosis book that I bought and it said, start your day relaxed. Think about how you want to plan your day and how you're going to go through your day. Oh, my God, that book. I, I, every time I did that, I made sales like you would not believe. 
and it became so scary. It worked every single time. I was scared to use it every, every day because I thought, I'm going to, it's like a, a lad lamp. I'm going to use my three wishes and I won't have them. So it's like, I would only use it like when I wanted money. I would think, okay, I'm going to do this. And, I, and it did. It worked every single time. Somebody borrowed that book from me. I can't even remember the name of the book. And they never returned it, probably because it was working for them too. And I, I, I don't even... I can't remember who I loaned it to or what, but it worked. But that what I learned from that is start your day off slow. Don't be in a rush don't, uh, to think about your day. Think about what you would like to happen during your day. And a lot of times you can will it to be. I mean, I've, I've been in situations like everybody that are bad situations, but I can will it right. I can, I can think to myself, all right, just calm down. It's life. Life is a roller coaster ride. It's going to have its ups and downs. Take a deep breath. Let's reevaluate this. It's not so bad. Let's take our next step, you know, and go on. And it changes, you know. You're not going to have a bad day every day you wake up. You're not going to have a good day every day you wake up. You're not going to be happily married every day. You're not going to be unhappily married every day. Take your life as it comes and, and, and be happy with it, you know. What so. keeps your wife busy? She, I, she's opposite of me. She, <laughs> I entertain her. Uh, she, she, she's uh, right now. She's in bad health, so it, it's right now she's just trying to to live and be out of pain. But in her early life, she always, I guess, I kind of direct her. She was very beautiful, and I tried to launch her in a modeling career. And I don't know why it didn't happen because to me, she's the most beautiful woman in the world. And I thought it should have happened, but she didn't have, I guess that was my wish for her, not her wish. And I think that's probably why it didn't happen. If it actually had been her wish, she could have made it happen, but she's always been unsure about what she wants to do and relying on me. And I think that's the reason you, you got to, you got to put it up here to make it happen. She never put an idea to where she wanted to be other than my wife. So it's like you, you've got to set goals in yourself and not rely on other people and take steps to achieve those goals. If you don't dream them, you can't have them. So it's got to start with the dream. It's got to start with the desire. And you have to work every day toward it and don't put a deadline on it. Just go small. You're not going to uh, let's say you wanted to win the lottery. Well, you can't win the lottery on your first time you buy a ticket. You're going to have to keep trying and trying and trying. But plan it in your mind, think I'm going to win the lottery. And I've known people who have actually done that. And it will happen because it's something about a destiny. Uh, putting it out there, it will come to you. And uh, it, 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 But you don't say, I got to have it by the time I pay bills. It's not going to happen. You know, just, just plant that idea out there. And somehow the universe just kind of answers you and, and what your desires are. I'm very yeah. sorry. Being healthy was one. I mean, oh. being healthy was one. When I lost my weight, uh, I thought, I want abs. I'm 70 year old and I have abs. Not many 70 year old men have abs, but I have them. I set that as one of my goals. So I did things to achieve it. So you, you just plant whatever you want to be, you can be. You know, if you uh, just whatever. I mean, I don't care what it is. If you plan that as a goal, you can reach it and just take small steps to get there. Mm. And again, I'm I'm very sorry to hear about your wife's uh, health and struggle. I mm -hmm. hope that uh, her pain is is reduced. Uh, but it's it it also sounds like through your life, like can you talk about the the homes that you have designed? Whose homes have you worked in? Honestly, I've never had a home that I wished I could do my best job because the biggest house I have was 2,600 square feet up in Laurel Brook here in Brentwood. But I still had to work around their likes and their budget. And they let me do a lot of things on my own, but still I was cognizant of what they could spend and what they, what they would like or appreciate. To me, as an interior designer, the only way an interior designer can show how talented they are is to do a design home where it, you're not working around the client. You can paint the walls anything you want to do. You can experiment and do things that hadn't been done before because it's a show home. 
you can borrow if things are expensive i can go borrow it from an antique dealer or whatever i can get these things out on a loan and return them they have the chance of selling them so when you go to a design home which i've been to many because they are more inspirational than a magazine because that's the chance that a designer can show their true talent because they're not if they wanted to paint the walls hot pink they can if they ask the client the client says, oh no i don't want hot pink walls well you can show what you can do with it a lot of times people just like you're scared of what you might happen People are scared to use color because they don't, they're not around it. If they could see what it could do, they're not scared of it. Many times I had clients and I would say, paint the ceiling black. And they look at me, why a black ceiling? I said, oh, a black ceiling, even in an eight foot room, it's like the night sky above you. So it doesn't really feel closed in. It feels more open because it's, it's no limit to how high the sky is at night. Uh, I've never in my life ever, except one time painted any ceiling white or used white trim. I don't do that. And there's a reason I don't do it is that uh, if all your walls are a color and there's no white in the room, why do you have a white ceiling? It's not part of the room. It's not part of the colors of the room. You're actually fencing yourself in like a fence with that white ceiling. Uh, I paint colors on trim. There's a reason people use white paint and I know they don't know it, but I wrote a book called what were you thinking, recognizing costly mistakes that, and, that people make? And one of them is using white trim. The, if you look back in history, when uh, culture became famous and people that were royalty and stuff like that, they had the first homes and stuff, they would do uh, trim that looked like malachite or stone or marble to look very expensive because anybody, everybody had wood, you could do that but you wanted to step a step above and have it look like an expensive material. As you go on and through history, you get the 1800s. If you look in your historical homes, all your rooms are different colors. They're all different trims. They didn't go to a paint store to buy a paint. They had a color expert that came in there, I guess something like what I am now back then, would come in and paint your room to the color trim that went with your furniture and the the environment it was in. It was a different color on the wall, different color on the trim, different color on your furniture, because you didn't have a big choice. You had to use what you did and worked around it. Uh, then the 1900s came and you had the American craftsmen and they did real wood. So you started having walnut trim and real wood trim and all that. Then what happened after that, the war started happening. And when the war started happening uh, and the soldiers came home, they started these little bungalow houses and the bungalow houses to start their family. They started using white trim because you could build these houses quickly. You could paint your trim white and, and, and it went with everything. So they started using white trim. It stayed on because these families of these soldiers started growing and they, and they had bigger and bigger homes. Well, back in that time, they didn't show homes completely uh, furnished like that. You walked in, and you walked into an empty house and you would see detail like dental work or egg and dart or beautiful moldings and they would be painted white. What happens is when you walk into an empty home, that white would pop, at, pop out and you would say, this must be a good builder because look at all this detail he put into building this home. In actuality, I don't, walk in, I don't want to walk into anybody's house and see the trim or before I see the furniture or the art or feel the room. To me, that white, if I had a, a, a black piece of paper, I put a white dot on it, you're gonna see that white dot. The only way that white dot is have other white dots so you see it as together, you got black and white. But one dot would make that stand out or the reverse of that. If you had a white piece of paper, put a black dot on it, where you look at, you look at that black dot, but it's several dots, you see the whole thing balanced out. So. To me, a, a room should be not really a focus per se or anything. You should walk in and feel a comfortable around it. You should feel beauty around it. I think of it like a cathedral. When you go into a cathedral, you see color, you see pattern, you see all this beautiful stuff. And it's not overwhelming. It's absolutely beautiful. You feel the room. You don't feel each little thing, you see the beautiful environment and you can feel that. And then you can appreciate the detail as you study the detail. You don't always walk in and see all the detail. You have to sit there and ponder it. I have 
I had a guest last night that was in here three hours and we were sitting in our living room and at three hours, she says, I keep looking around and I keep seeing more and more details, more things that I just didn't see when I walked in. Obviously, there's things that you're going to see that just stand out because of their size. But it's all those little details that make it interesting. It's, I call it food for the eyes. You know, uh, the new wears off. After the new wears off, if you just got a few things, you just get bored with it. So you have little details that you will notice and other people will notice to make it better and better and better. That's where I stand. <laughs> no, that this is this is great. So you're t you're not just simply talking about pretty colors here. You're actually talking about psychology and you're talking about the human mind. You're talking about the way that our mm -hmm. minds work inside different environments. And you know, I've True. talked about this uh, before. The reason that I chose this color behind me is because part of the work mm -hmm. that I do is uh, the helping people with their spirit. And blue is the color of the throat chakra. And what we do is we talk. And so I've got this blue emanating out from behind me. So there's a meaning in the color and the car matches it and, and everything like that. I've got this psychedelic tree over here. Uh, the color on the mm -hmm. wall makes for a much richer look from this angle. And so can you talk a little bit about psychology, the person, the environment that we live in? And, and, and very much can. Yeah, please go for it. Uh, one of my very best friends, and well, started off as a client, but she was a very best friend. And she was a heart doctor. And being a heart, well, she started when I knew her, she was just a nurse and she became a heart, doc, heart doctor. As life went on, she became wealthy. When I knew her, she wasn't. But, uh, and when I was asked to do her new beautiful home that she had worked so hard and tried so hard to reach her goals and finally got it, I said, let's do color. You're dealing with stressful situations, telling somebody they may or may not live. We've got to do this and this and this. I want to make your house the most fun house I've ever done in my life. You're a bubbly personality. You, you She's a person that doesn't meet a stranger. She's very kind. I've heard stories where she would uh, have a client that couldn't afford clothes and she'd say, somebody gifted me this, it's not my size, I'll give it to you. She didn't tell him I bought it. She just said, I give it to you because somebody gave it to me. So she would do things to help people without the recognition and find a way to do it. And I love her for that. So I knew the kind of person she was. So when I was doing her house, I was picking colors that made me think of her. You know, that made me think about this is joyful. This is fun. This is divvy. This is who I, this is her personality. And, and, and I knew it. I mean, I didn't, I had customers all my life that would give me keys to their house and I didn't push things that would sell them. But as I was shopping, if I saw something that made me think of them, I call them up and say, Juanita, this, this makes me, I think this would look good in your living room. Bring it over, write me a check and be done with it. Because I didn't use the abuse, just like you don't use the abuse of the famous people. If it, if it makes you think of them, and it and that's why I did it. You know, if I'm with knowing a famous person and they think of me, that's why they did it. They didn't do it because I'm asking. They're not doing it because who you are. I'm doing it because I know that's going to make your life better. It's going to make you enjoy your life. I'm helping you. You know, so that gives me joy. I mean, I never used the same clients. I never did like the in color or whatever. I did colors that made me think of that person. And and I'd never do it. And I never I never remember colors because sometimes I mix my colors. So it's like I, I want something that, that makes me think of that person. I want their home to look like them. I don't want it to look like 2023 or 2000 or whatever decade I did it in. I want it to look like them. Not, uh, I want my home. My home has things in here since I was 16 years old. I, I, I was looking at our wedding pictures. We celebrated our 42nd wedding anniversary. In the background, I have an orchid flower arrangement and a vase. I still have that. It's in my guest bedroom. 42 years of silk flower 
It's still in my house. I love it. It's like I don't change it just because it's old. Uh, if it still brings me joy and I love it and it works, I keep it. You know, I don't. The only things I'll change is if, if it wears out or gets destroyed or I see something better, then I might change it. But often I, I'm at the point now I, I can't even find better, you know, so. Yeah. So does that help? you conceptualize people with an aesthetic with with colors yeah. i'm sure that there is a little bit of their personality this person seems more cosmopolitan this same person seems more classical this person seems more rustic right. what have you and and you right you you put together this thing now have people talked to you about how their their process and i'm talking about their creativity their 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 experience of their space has changed after you reworked things the joy that they experience in their, their attitude life. i i have i have a very good story on that uh i had a client she's passed on now her name was juanita patterson and she was not a wealthy person and her her fa her husband had died and she had three sons and she was kind of depressed when, when she came to see me and i said uh and she had a little small home and not much money i said well, let's paint your living room yellow. Let's do your bedroom pink. I said, you've lived with four men. You've been a mother and a, and a wife all your life. Now you're a woman. So let's make this house look totally feminine. Show who you are. And with that, she gave me more referrals than anybody I've ever had rich or poor because she referred, I did all three sons house. I did the office where she worked. I could count on every year she would tell somebody how I changed her life for the better and that I could do the same for them. And uh, and it, it just went on to the day she died. Actually, she turned 80 and she got remarried again. And I did her and her new husband's house again. And I used some of the things that she already had and reinvented for their new space in their life at the end of their life together. So it's like, yes, you can change. I mean, I like Dolly had an expression said money can't buy you happiness, but it does make misery more comfortable. And it does. I mean, think why do people take vacations? They take vacations to escape their life, to get in an environment that's beautiful. So they feel relaxed and comfortable and relieved. Your home can do the same thing. My home, when I come, I have hardly taken any vacations. I come home. That's my retreat. It gives me joy. I look at the beauty and the things around me and I'm relaxed. I'm comfortable. I'm happy. I don't need to take a vacation. I can't think of any place that would be better to be than my own home because I created it the way I wanted it. So you know, I work with I, I work with people who are struggling with many different things, anxiety, depression, grief, these different things. And I I always hone in on on diet, good habits, sleep, you know, the the things that just start resetting your body. Make sure that you can sleep all the way through the night. Make sure that your food you're eating is actually nutritious for your body. You know, include include this nutrient and that nutrient. These these sorts of things that just create the base level of help. But one thing I've never done is is talk to people about do you love your environment where you live and 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 I mean, we we talk about family members, but I'm but what we're talking about now is the aesthetic of where it is that you call your space in this world. Even if it's a studio apartment, do you love being there? Does it make you exactly. feel cozy, creative, happy, like you want to be there? Like you could go to Yosemite, but you also would love to be at home just the same. Exactly. And you have power over that. You can create whatever makes you happy. You can put in or take out whatever makes you happy there. Unlike your family, you can't control your family. So I don't count family as, as part of making anybody happy. In fact, I saw something on uh, a long time ago, and I always remembered. It said the number one thing that will make people happy is not money, not your family, is how fast you can get to work. And I thought about that, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. because if you're not in a hurry and a rush and driving through traffic and or had an argument with your spouse or something and you're you're thinking, you know, people that you come in contact, they feel that tension. They don't have to know about it, but they can feel it. I knew that in sales. 
the people that did sales are the ones that are the happiest and they feel my joy and I, they feel the joy I give them and I feel the joy for them when I'm helping them. It's not, I can't, it's got to come from the heart first. So little things that give you tension or stress, you don't have to say anything to anybody. They can feel it when you come con- 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 in contact with them. So somebody who's depressed and anxiety and all that, I think it's very important for them to realize Create a calming space. Create a space that you love. Create somewhere you want. It's a safe zone. This is your safe zone. This is where I feel like I am who I am. You know, I want things or if it's art, art makes me happy, antiques make me happy. But let's say it's something else. Let's say you collected something or something that brings back a childhood memory or 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 just, if you analyze your life, there's reasons you are who you are from things that have happened in your life. And if you realize that, you can take those things away and put things that do make you happy. You know, you can forget the past and bring in the present and create the life that you want to leave, live. I mean, yeah. So that's that's very very strong. And as you're as you're talking about this, I'm kind of like going on this journey of this, creating the aesthetic of the life that you really need to live and and that makes you feel mm-hmm. a sense of inspiration and joy and you know that the home environment that's behind you now i'm just going to speak for the sake of people who are just listening because there's video and then there's going to be the audio mm-hmm. podcast of this this wonder you have this these urns behind you you have this really interesting rich color on your wall with these pillows on it on a on a bed where they have these the gold and maroon colors on them. It's well, it's a space that. It's, yeah, go ahead. Well, if you Google Howard Wiggins Facebook, just a regular Howard Wiggins Facebook, I post pictures of my home all the time. Again, it's like I said, this is an Oriental room. I, there's this. I want to see if I can do it. There's this, this bed behind me. Uh, it is. Uh, it's it just anyway. It's 400 years old. It's eight and a half feet tall. Uh, I saw this as a child. I went to uh, an auction with my stepfather, and uh, this bed came up at an auction. I mean, I, I, was, I couldn't afford it. I didn't have it. But it stood in my mind as the most beautiful bed I've ever seen in my life. And it's always, oh, it's always been there as the most beautiful bed in my life. So years came about, and I... Uh, I, are we still on? We are still on. Yeah. There it is. Uh, years came about where I was helping a client. I was uh, telling her about beautiful things, and she knows who I am. She said, Howard, I saw this client of mine is going to send a bed to Sotheby's, and it's eight and a half foot tall. He lives in Brentwood. It's going to cost him a lot of money to get his Sotheby's to the auction. She started describing it. I said, I saw that as a kid. I thought that was the most beautiful bed I've ever seen in my life. Fate had it. He walked in the door at, at that store at that time, and she introduced me for it. And he told me he was going to send the bed. I said, how much do you want for it? And he told me, and it was a good price, but I got an inheritance, so I, I could afford it. So I said, I'll buy your bed. Uh, and I moved into this place where I'm now. It didn't have, the, it was an eight-foot ceiling. The bed's eight and a half foot tall. So I was just about to remodel, so I made my room a tray ceiling so i could put the bed in the middle of the room i had it uh had to figure out how to get it up here had to horse it over the balcony but i wanted it and i made it happen it was uh, uh and it was a memory in my mind and it and i remember thinking it's the most beautiful bed in my life and i had an opportunity to buy it so i made it happen so it's just like you like i said it, it's fate. Fate just led me that way. And then that, because I did that, led me into my beautiful rooms, led me into the Andrew Martin interior design. It's one of the most talented designers in the world because I collected things that actually I, I, I'm surprised I even got them because it's they're, they're, I just have an eye to know what's what. And uh, it's they're way more valuable than what I paid for them. But I just have that eye to know. As a teenager, uh, 
I got a car when I was 16 years old because the neighbor's wife had died and they didn't have kids. So when I was 16 years old, I had a DeVille Cadillac that was only two years old with like 3,000 miles on it. And so here I am as a teenager and I'm driving a Cadillac like some 60 year old man. And I used to fantasize and go to Cheekwood and think, I'm coming back from Europe and that's my house. And, you know, and I felt rich, even though I wasn't rich, but it set in that mentality. I like that feeling. I want to be surrounded by beautiful. I want that lifestyle. I want to live like that. And so I've always maintained it. I never dreamed of having a big house. I don't have a big house. I dreamed of having the most beautiful house for me that I could create. And I do. And I work toward that. All my life, every step, every purchase I made, I'm thinking I want it to be, I want, I want to have the most beautiful bed I've ever seen. That's the most beautiful vase I've ever seen. I want to have the most beautiful lamp I've ever seen. Everything I have, I want it to be the best that I've ever seen. And, and as I went through life, I had, uh, of course, I couldn't afford it right off. I would buy things, sell it, buy another thing, sell it, buy another thing, sell and work up to where I could have the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So I, I think about that. Even today, I can still do that. I mean, I don't replace things unless I see something better, and then I'll try to sell what I got to get that. So that's just a, a goal I had even as a kid. So, so somebody it so made my life. What what I see, and you you alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that the average person in let's just say the United States, they live in a space with white walls. And the, the white walls are often a primer color that were there from the designer in order for somebody to put color on the wall should they wish to do that. But most people generally don't do that because we've grown up around walls that are white and, you know, quite honestly, around art that is mass produced, art that is um, not particularly unique or says something about you as an individual. And so what would you say to people who are kind of living in a space that does not inspire them, a space that, that does not give them, you know, that, that sense of peace where they are? I, I know why people are the way they are, because I've helped enough people through my 50 years of interior design. What happens is a lot of people, they think they're right and they don't listen to anybody else and, and they make mistakes. And a lot of times uh, I help a client and I tell them, I have reasons why I say everything I say. And if you listen to the reason, it makes sense. But if you don't listen to the reason and you're stubborn, then you're just always going to make the same mistake. And what has happened, a lot of times dealing with those people, they take a long time to deal with because they keep analyzing everything and everything and finding excuses why they don't like it or they can't do it or they just say I don't like it and they'll have a reason behind it and they keep making mistakes which makes them not trust anybody and and they don't trust themselves and they they become worse and worse and worse because every time they do make a, a decision it's because they've reached the point I'm just tired of fooling with this now I'm just make a safe decision and go with it but that's not satisfying what they need it's just they just don't have the the power or the knowledge to make the right decision what i've seen is when i go to a client's house we all have beautiful things and things that we made mistakes i always been the type of designers that i look around and i'm thinking that's a beautiful piece that's not you know so i'll tell them to eliminate what's not beautiful and work around with what's beautiful and then I'll tell them, the reason I'm doing this is because you've got this beautiful vase behind me. If I do the walls yellow, it's going to complement that vase. And if I do it in a, the right way, it changes their life because they can see why I'm doing it. They can see the value of doing it. They can see how it can change. When you talk about white walls, white walls are what they paint mental institutions. That's not what you pay to be a friendly or make an environment. Mental institutions are white. Now, I'm not saying you can't have white. There are beautiful new neutrals out now. There's a vanilla white that I absolutely adore. And I have nothing against white. But for a backdrop, you want to have a connection with that color. You want to, you want to possess that color. It's got to be a color that makes you happy. I don't know anybody has a white wall that makes them happy. 
like your beautiful blue wall, I can understand that. And and art galleries, they'll say, well, museums do white walls. Museums do white walls because they can't paint every time they have a new exhibit. But just like your artwork or artwork that I have, it's like, I, I tell a woman, it's like eye color. If a woman has blue eyes, and or let's take it back. Let's say a woman has brown eyes. And back in the 60s, all the women were doing that blue eye shadow. And you saw the eye shadow, but you didn't see the eye. The colors that you put around somebody can bring out those eyes. Elizabeth Taylor, with her violet eyes, always had that violet eye shadow because it brought out the color out of her eyes. Anybody else could put that on. And you'll see that valid eye shadow. It's got to complement what is there and not take away from it, but enhance what is around it. So just like you choosing the wall with the blue. Now, which I do predict in the future, because we're going through this period of all neutral, it's the next generation. It's going to be the first generation not to match, not to be scared of color, because they're going to crave color, because they're not going to... They, you, you, everywhere you look is neutral. Like when I looked in 85 and everything was mauve and blue, I was sick of mauve and blue. I don't want to see it again. But if everything you're looking at is neutral now, that next generation is going to have 18 years living at home and they're going to be happy to have a new home to be able to use colors that brings them happiness, brings them joy. And they're not going to match. All generations before pretty much match colors. You don't even have to match colors. You can stay in the range of a color and that's a lot more exciting than matching a color. Because if you look at prints and patterns, they have shades of blue or shades of this color. You don't have to be the exact shade. You just need to be in the, the let's say the purpley blue family or the gray blue family to make it work. You don't have to be that shade exact and it will work. What is your favorite aesthetic? What is your favorite kind of design to do? Eclectic, because I, I want to be totally, my my bedroom's kind of uh, French. My living room is more contemporary and dark and very artsy looking. The uh, kitchen's real trad traditional looking. I've got a coffee room that is nowhere else in the house, that in the but it's a bright, cheerful color. And it's, I mean, there for a little bit of time and it brings me joy in the morning. It feels like a morning color. I think the psychology around color, is just important as the color itself, you know, because like I said, you're creating an environment that you want to be in and your environment needs change as you go through life or you go through the day. So like I said, I don't want to be, I, mean, I use my living room for like my company at night. So it's black. It looks great at night. It looks better at night than it does in the daytime because I've got my lighting and my art and you can, certain things you notice, certain things you don't notice. Daytime is not as pretty. Daytime, my kitchen's got skylight in it. It's a, a, a orangey color. It's more cheerful colors. It looks better in daylight because that's where I am in the morning. It's in the kitchen, you know. So I think about how I'm going to use it. The, the bedrooms are restful colors. So you want to do colors that make you feel restful. Dark colors make me feel restful. I could not really sleep in a, a bright color bedroom because that's energetic. It's giving me daytime feelings. I want a restful, calming environment at night. I want something that relaxes me. I don't want to uh, be hyped up. <laughs> yeah, no no so. kidding. I, I, I'm thinking about your dedication in your life to reinvention and how much that kind of dovetails with the concept of reinventing the look of a space and changing it. Because when you do that, you put that color on the wall, the whole psychology of you spending time in that place, it changes. You become more of the space. You were talking about the calming colors of a sleeping space and that sort of thing. Now, Younger people are likely going to be living in smaller spaces. I'm seeing more of that coming up where um, the tiny home thing, a more of an austere approach to, to life is, is occurring, mainly because of the cost of housing and these sorts of things. Have you, uh, have you seen people or worked a little bit on smaller spaces like that? And, and how is the I have, and that makes a, a bit, but I think what's going to happen in the future, you're going to have technology 
where you can actually have a, you can change your wall, you can change, you know, they've already got technology that I could do a spotlight and I could change that to look like the ocean. I could change the scene to look like something else. So I think what you're going to see is technology changing. So they have power to just switch their environment at a flick of a button. So they're, that the space has changed. So there's that need in you to go somewhere. If you are, if you're in jail and you're in a jail cell, you're seeing that thing day in and day out, you want to escape. So even though you're in a smaller situation, so there's got to be things that you can do to feel like you're not trapped in that environment, that you, that you can change it, you can change the wall color, you can do that. I mean, there's, there's things, of, I've got one client, we had a TV set, she's not a TV person, but she's got an app on her phone and you can put art in Atlanta and you can go to the art galleries and you can pop on your screen a copy of that art gallery's art. You could change it to Christmas scenes at Christmas. You could change it to your family members if you're you're feeling homesick. You can change whatever you want to see on that wall with that screen. That's already exists. You could do that now. What's going to happen where you're going to do it to the whole room, the whole wall, you know, kind of like uh, you watch Star Trek and they go in that little tube and then they, they just get in a whole new space. It's going to happen. I mean, technology is going to keep up with the need of people. So, overall, your life, you've been around people who are astonishing. You have decorated spaces to increase and enhance the human experience in those spaces and the 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 sense of that space, the creativity in that space, and these sorts of things. Overall, in a lifetime would have been the kind of big themes that have made you who you are, that, that you would say are the big takeaway lessons of your life? Well, I think recognizing that de designer's talent when they did my parents' house, I saw it at an early age and I could see what it could do to the way you feel and feel about yourself. Uh, I think, I don't, I don't know. I, to answer a question, it's just... Um, Put yourself in the environment you want to be like and what you want to be like and have friends that are like you and appreciate the things that you do. Uh, I mean, that could be music. It could be dance. It could be art. It could be anything you want to do. Find the thing that makes you happy. I started off being a vet. I knew the very first year, I don't know why. I think I wanted to be a vet because I liked my dog, you know, like all kids do. But when I got to be a vet, that includes farm animals. I don't like all the process. I didn't like it. I based it on a wrong decision. Well, I thought, well, a vet makes decent money. I'll have a nice life. But that wasn't me. That You've got to discover who you are and what makes you happy. It could be cooking. My friend Rachel Robertson's on the thing. Her thing is cooking. She creates all these beautiful meals for herself. Not to be in a cookbook, but it led her to be on the cookbook. It made her who she is, but her real true love is cooking. And she's fabulous at it. Find what brings you joy. If you're happy every day, cooking, designing, singing, writing songs, whatever creative process you do, or even an accountant or whatever it is, do what brings you joy. Don't worry about the money. The money will come. The main thing is happiness. Nobody ever, if I had, and I look at life this way, if they told me I was going to die in four weeks, I never said, I wish I had more, or I wish I had money. I enjoyed the life I led up until now, and bye-bye. I don't do it to obtain whatever it is. I do it because it makes me happy. My, 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 my parents didn't understand it when I was little because they said, why are you buying these expensive things when you're a child? And I'm like, it makes me happy. She said, you don't entertain. I, I'm not doing it to show off. I'm not doing it to, to impress you. I'm doing it because it makes me happy. I have the true reasons why I'm doing it. Other people may do it to, to show off or show their wealth or whatever. I'm doing it because I makes me happy. I mean, same way you go to Europe and you want to see the, the museums and things like that. It brings you joy to be in that environment. And I can feel it. And I and I'm I guess everybody can't, but I can't. I can go anywhere, even if it's a junkie store, 
And I'll still find the beauty in that store because I'm always searching for beauty, period. You know. There's a big catchphrase that's out there right now. And 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 I'm gonna say it in a second, but you have distilled it into such an understandable and tangible sense of the whole thing. And the and the the phrase is mindset of abundance right and and we hear this a lot that if you approach things with a mindset of abundance abundance will come to you and it's 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 a little bit of a i don't understand how that works but when you talk about it in in how you're you're saying it, you're you're saying here approach your life from a perspective of looking for the good looking for the beauty creating the beauty around you making a space for yourself in this world that even if you are whether you're wealthy or not that you love the space where you are that you love the space in the world that you occupy that you feel a sense of possibility you feel a sense uh that you are living in a space that is beautiful to you and that you've taken the steps around you in your environment to make it a beautiful place and and what that's done in your life is that you have led a life where you have created beauty and you have this giant wake of beauty behind you. It's both physical and aesthetic and also the wonderful friendships that you have made with people throughout a life that have uplifted them and that have um, well, you know, created a, a better world. Well, my perfect example is Dolly. Dolly came from nothing. She dreamed of becoming a country singer. She dreamed of looking the way she did. She tells the story about the prostitute that lived in her town. Because a kid is only exposed to what they can do. They can't get in the car. They, if you're poor, you don't know you're poor. Because everybody around you is poor. You're not rich if you don't see anybody rich. I mean, you've got to be exposed to it to want it. And so in her life, and she tells the story all the time about the, the prostitute with the wigs and the makeup and all that. She actually stowed a tube of lipstick when she was little because she wanted to look like that woman so bad. If everybody else is all nasty and not pretty and no makeup all around you, and there's this one woman that is, that's, she expired to looking good. She wrote uh, Code of Many Colors at age five. She had a natural talent just like I have that she recognized even as a child. She took her natural talent and decided who she wanted to be and became that person and kept going. Same way I, I recognized the talent that I had as a child and developed it as I got older. When parents say, I want the kid to be a doctor, or I want some, or like I told my wife, I want her to be a model. If she didn't feel it, she's not gonna be that successful model. If she wanted to be a model, she would have become a successful model. So it's like, recognize your children's strengths. What are they most happy doing what brings them joy and do it. Um, one thing I also learned is the most being around a lot of wealthy people, a lot of wealthy people did not go to college at all. Right, right. Wealthy people doing what they recognize are their talents and they have no fear of being at the bottom because they came from the bottom. It couldn't get in a worse life than Dolly grew up as a kid. So take the chances, take the things because she was bathing in a creek. They didn't have water. She didn't have food on the table unless they hunted for it. Uh, uh, in my eyes, a horrible life, but in her eyes, a joyful life because it's the only life she remembers and had. But but uh, but when you're a comfortable zone, my parents always said, don't worry about it. You're going to get the inheritance someday anyway. It took away my desire to, to become famous when I was young because I thought, well, I'm going to have it someday. Why, you know, why I work hard. But what, what I didn't realize, what they thought was comfortable, it's not what I think is comfortable, you know, because they grew up in depression, having a paid for home is comfortable for them. To me, I want more than that, you know. So it's like, uh, find out what makes you happy, create, your, recognize your talents and develop your talents. Don't listen, don't have anybody, don't follow anybody's footsteps, don't, don't uh, listen to other people. You figure it out for yourself. What it's going to take to make you be who you are. Have no rush to do it and do little steps to get you there. Uh, you can't become Taylor Swift. You can't 
become Dolly Parton by doing what they do. You've got to figure out yourself what will help you get to where you need to be and take those steps to do it. So, you know, your words resonate so strongly and I'm really happy to have had you here because you really embody the, the, the whole concept of you, you, you do you, you buck the system, you lay out the things that are important to you and you go for it. You create your brand. You create your value. You, 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 you do that. Nobody else can define what that is for you. Once you find it, and like you said earlier, the success will come. Once you are really well defined, once your value in the market is something that is you're prov you're providing an incredible value to to others because of the value that you have created inside yourself. And what you do is you create beautiful spaces for people. Well, I think it also get. I think the reason I'm a successful interior designers is that you use psychology behind your head. You got to think. Why is that person telling me they don't want white walls? Well, give me a reason why you don't want white walls. Why do you not like that? Give me a reason. If you can't give me a reason, then you have no reason. I can give you a reason why I feel the way I do for you to have a colored wall, for you to not have this. If you can't give me a reason why why not to do color, then why, why are you right and I'm wrong? You know, in your eyes, it's like everybody has a reason to to become who they are. Everybody has a, I mean, it's your childhood, you could tell the same thing to one child and tell it to another child. It's going to affect this child and not affect that child. People hear what they want to hear. They listen to what they want to hear and they soak into what there is. You can have a horrible environment, but if you let that soak in and become your life, you're going to live in the horrible environment. If you recognize, hey, I come from a horrible environment, I want to change it. I don't want to live like this. I want to change my life. I, I'll be honest. My, my stepfather, uh, not my stepfather, my father, he was on the road. He was a famous person. But I didn't think he was a very good husband to my mother. And I thought, well, when I get married, I'm not going to be like him. I'm not going to cheat on her. I'm not going to do what he did to my mother. I'm going to be a better man than he is. But I recognize it, and I recognize what I need to change. Some people can come up in their environment and they'll grow up just like their father because they saw their father treat their mother that way and they're going to treat their wife that way. If you don't recognize what's wrong, you can't fix it. So if there's anything about your personality or anything that you don't like, you can fix it. You're a person. You're a human. We've got that power. You know, if, if you, like Dolly, if you didn't like being poor, you change it. You've got that power. You, you know, you've. If it doesn't, if it's harmful memories, erase them, get rid of them, create new memories. We've got every day is a new start to a new life. Go for it. Yeah. Now, well, Howard, thank you so much for your time here. Thank you for, you know, telling these, these wonderful stories of your life. I feel like the big theme with your story is about creating beauty, about creating possibility and about having real substantive relationships with people throughout a lifetime that that uh, people at their very core are human and that we all need friendship and inspiration and that these things are really the quintessential thing that makes makes everything kind of fit together as you build the skyscraper of your career and your life and your marriage and and all of these things and so you know the the the, com the complexity of your story thank you so much for coming and sharing all of these things my pleasure my pleasure it's what i do and i love it so i'm glad i, I could admit, i could bring it to your eyes and and share it with you well yes and uh to the listener thank you so much for listening and please make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps when we're building a, a, a podcast like this. Thank you to our wonderful guest, Howard Wiggins, for sharing his story and his values and all of this. And to all the listeners, please, I am Jeremy from High Altitude Mindset, CEO, therapist, and transformational coach. 
Now go be something great.